Right, sorry about that. Um, all in order now, I think. Yes. There's not to make reply. There's not a reason why. There's but to do and die into the valley of death, road the 600. So we've got there's repeated three times, and for obviously. So it's not the soldier's role, perhaps, to make reply to reason why, um, but it may be ours, and that may be something that Tennyson subtly um, pointing at, which again may be very subtly subversive. So we might, you know, we should argue that actually this should never have happened. Um, we need to ponder why it happened in the first place and who was to blame. And, um, and how this such a thing could have occurred. Do and die. So and here the connective, it makes death seem inevitable. So there's but to do, there's but to perform their duty and die, because <clears throat> that is what this order will ultimately lead to. There's no way they're going to get out of such an awful situation. Um, however, <clears throat> tying in with the beliefs of the time again, patriotism is more important than self-preservation. Um, so you can take it one or two ways one or one of two ways, rather. So um, either unfailing, the unfailing obedience of the soldiers is being praised or it's being questioned. Um, and obviously the surface reading is that it's being praised, but very subtly through the little techniques that we've been looking at, Tennyson might be actually pointing to the fact that things aren't as good as they appear, or they don't appear good at all, but it's he's even struggling as poet laureate to put a positive spin on it. Um, Valley of Death, Anaphora, obviously, an emphasis on death and possibly even personification here with the um, capitalization of death, as if death is waiting for them, the grim reaper in this valley, pointing out again that it's inevitable. And 600, once again, that's how the stanza closes, it's this refrain, and it emphasizes once more the scale of loss. 100, and yeah, this is what I said, this ties together to the previous point um, of blunder, to the fact that it's a half rhyme because of this blunder. 600 men's lives are in grave, grave danger, and not not all of them will get out of their danger. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. So Enaphora again, cannon repeated three times, it emphasizes a number of cannons um, and how it, you know, it's inescapable, which again in turn emphasizes the bravery and ability of the soldiers, but also the stupidity of the order. To right, to left, so the fact that there's no the, and this is often misquoted, there is no the, it's cannon to right, cannon to left. It's a subtle grammatical trick which makes it sound as though the soldiers are completely surrounded. So the, the idea that the cannon are all along the right of the valley and all along the left, not just on specific parts, not just to the right, so directly to their right, it's all along that side of the valley and on the other side too, and at the end. So the charge absolutely is doomed. They're completely surrounded. And again, think back to that picture, how all of these cannonballs are pouring down into the centre of the valley. Stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. So I haven't put any specific notes here because it's pretty obvious, you know, you can, I've picked out what words you can look at. So stormed, jaws, mouth of hell, and the refrain of 600 again. Um, I shan't go on in a little bit more too detail here. Sorry, I shan't go on in too much detail here because I've got some more subtle, more interesting points to make later. But obviously you can look at connotations of a storm, connotation of jaws, and connotation of hell as well. And the mouth of hell, the idea is it's going to swallow the map and there's no escape. Maybe even a subtle you know, condemnation. It was a sin that somebody could give this order and condemn all these men to death. Um, and then jaws, you know, this animalistic fury that's being unleashed on them in a storm again, you know, chaos. Where I've done a surface uh, analysis for that anyway. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. So obviously, you know, flashed there, you can look again, they're still putting on a, a brave fight um, in spite of the unparalleled odds. But the fact that, you know, it's just 600, that doesn't make up an army. And they're against an entire army, so the odds are definitely not in their favour. And a more subtle point you can make, the alliteration here, while all the world wondered, it's wistful, it's mirroring this sense of wonder. And again, this can be read two ways. Um, firstly, we are supposed to be in wonder at their courage, we're supposed to be awed by it, by their loyalty, or we're wondering why on earth they're doing it, why on earth this happened. So it can be read as questioning and introduces that element of doubt 
is the sacrifice? Was the sacrifice needful? Was it necessary? Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. So um, the subtle point, again, I've picked out um, plunged, broke and reeled as um, some words you can do connotations for. Plunging again, there's no hesitation. They're, they're diving right into the enemy, should I say, bravery. Broke, um, yes, they're shattering um, the enemy in, in this initial attack, even though they have to retreat, but also, you know, they're broken men, and the 600 is broken. There aren't that many left afterwards. Um, and then reeling again, it shows their sense of power that they're still able to create this impression. Um, but the most, uh, the more subtle point, that sort of something might give you the higher grade, um, is Russian. It doesn't rhyme with anything. So again, it breaks the pattern. Uh, so smoke and broke and stroke, but you've got Russian in the middle there. And it's as though this word is misplaced, just as the people in Britain believed that the war with Russia was misplaced and was nothing to do with Britain at all. Britain shouldn't have gone involved. Um, and this bit here, another high level point, I think this is something that an Oxford professor, professor actually made. So if you think it's a bit far-fetched, take it up with him. Um, erd, so shattered and sundered. Erd is a subtle reminder that there was an error made when you err, to err is to, to make an error. And so all this goes back to the fact that um, all this chaos is from one person's decision uh, or one you know, misplaced order or one um, garbled communication is causing all this death needless death and that's what it comes down to and so you've got this subtle reminder here within the words shattered and sundered all this is happening because of this mistake which shows again that the system there's something wrong with it <clears throat> oh and then i've highlighted um, the sibilants here battery smoke saber stroke shattered and sundered um, and also the harsh t sounds here stroke shattered uh, and, and the d is at the end of the same sort of thing so it's introducing this more sinister element that um Again, all this is happening because of a mistake. Um, then they rode back, but not not the 600. So more basic point here, repetition of not. Again, it's showing the, the cost, the scale of, of this this the sense of loss. Then cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered. It's as before. The same points can be made, but the fact that we've got this um, these lines repeated, again, it shows the emphasis on it and creates a sort of cyclical structure. So the poem is surrounded almost by itself, just as the cavalry were. So even though they're retreating, um, trying to get to safety, the danger is still there. So they have to go through the valley of death, not once, but twice. And so they're going to lose even more men. Stormed ad was shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death. Um, so obviously we've got um, hero and fought so well, so that's Tennyson putting a positive spin on it, a bit more of a basic point there. Um, but came through the jaws of death, um, so you know, usually, you know, jaws or a mouth, it, it swallows things and they've ridden right into it. However, the fact they're coming back, some of them, is creating this image of the Night Brigade conquering death and maybe also through Tennyson achieving immortality in this poem. I mean, we still remember the Charge of the Night Brigade because we're still reading and studying this very famous poem. Back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of 600. And so we've got left repeated twice, um, anaphora here, and again linking to the scale of loss of all of the men's lives, um, all the men that died in the charge. But also, um, very subtly, left obviously is the opposite of right and so there's a subtle subversion here that the war is not right this war is wrong which hints perhaps at Tennyson's deeper dissatisfaction and then we've got the very last stanza um, uh, here or rather in two parts over the next slide as well when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honor the charge they made um, this, this, we've got on the surface pretty celebratory language here and exclamatives as well you know almost as though uh, shouting this from the rooftops as though it's something to be proud of however um wondered and this one word one could look at the true uh, the, sorry the, the, the message of the poem you've got you can split it into two you've got one so the sense of pride that the night brigade have won this this fame and they've shown their worth um, even though the battle itself was not specifically won by the british however you've got erd again so one 
dirt. Um, it all comes from a, a mistake which undermines this sense of pride that Tennyson ostensibly shows and that you know, the army supposedly has in such blind obedience. And so again, in this one word, again, it throws it back to us as well, you know, are we wondering at their bravery or are we wondering why they died in the first place, why they charged, how this came to be? Um, so the whole poem could be pared down to this one word, you could say. And then honour, we are instructed, this is an imperative, honour the charge they made, because that's Tennyson's job, it's his duty as, a, as poet laureate. Um, so it's his instruction to the readers, the public, to celebrate this charge, because the newspapers were actually beginning, you know, you saw that one Times report, and that was pretty damning, but I mean, it put a positive spin on it, but other papers, other reports are beginning to be a little more critical of the war, and Tennyson needs to be on the side of the establishment of the government. Honour the Night Brigade, Noble 600. There's the last two lines. Honour, Anna Fora emphasises the previous point. Um, a noble 600. Noble, obviously it shows a sense of bravery and worth being far-famed, worthy of being far-famed and honoured. Um, but also you've got the exclamative at the end, the exclamation mark, and that emphasises the instruction, emphasises Tennyson's apparent passion, but it also conveys, um, oh yes, it also conveys the vigour as well, you know, of his sense of pride. And so that is a um, brief overview of what I believe are the most important parts of the poem. There again is a question if you want to practice that. Um, but yes, I hope it has been useful.